Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our presentation from Jeff Nemo and Phil Juke on getting to know the Ministry of Agriculture. We are going to do a roundtable of introductions before we hand the controls over to Jeff and Phil. But first, I'll just do a short introduction so you can know um, how this event came to be today. So my name is Rachel, and I coordinate the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisor Program. It's my pleasure today to welcome Jeff and Phil with the BC Ministry of Agriculture to give us an overview of programs. Um, if those of you on the Zoom today aren't familiar with the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors, this is an agricultural extension program in the southeastern portion of the province, specifically the Kootenai and Boundary region, that is funded by three regional districts, the regional district of Kootenai Boundary, East Kootenai, and Central Kootenai, and also Columbia Basin Trust. Um, this, the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors, it's a free service and program to commercial agricultural producers to connect them with production resources, best practices, and support networking and education in the sector. Uh, KBFA has been running for almost six years now, and we've had great support and collaboration with the BC Ministry of Agriculture. When I first started with my role with the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors six years ago, the Ministry of Agriculture seemed like a big black box in the Fraser Valley. I had no idea what it did. But since then, I have a much better understanding, and we often connect producers with the services and programs offered by the Ministry of Agriculture. This event today was sparked for a few reasons. First, we realized that for many people in the Kootenays, there's a lack of understanding about the services and programs of the ministry. Um, second, Jeff Nemo, um, he's in the the upper left hand of my box there. You can wave Jeff, <laughs> he'll be presented anyways. Um, he's brand new to his role and he's based out of Creston. Previous to that, his uh, predecessor was Kevin Murphy. And so Jeff is, has just moved to the region, I guess, in the last six months. And he's looking for opportunities to get to know producers. And we also want to make sure producers know who Jeff is. And Phil, um, do you want to just wave your hand there? Phil's uh, serving the boundary region and he's based more physically in the Okanagan area, but we also haven't um, had many introductions between producers and Phil in the, with KBFA. So we thought this was a good opportunity to make those linkages. Uh, lastly, there may be some new announcements coming from the ministry in the next year as they reallocate resources for their next five-year funding cycle. Jeff and Phil will explain more about that in their presentation. Um, we are recording this presentation, so you We'll have it on our archives. You can send it to folks who you think might also benefit from this presentation. Um, if you have questions, you can enter them into the Q&A box. At the end, we're also gonna have just a casual chit chat. So you can save your questions and we'll just have an open-ended Q&A session at the end. And before I hand the controls over to Jeff, I just wanted to introduce the team for the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors because we're all here today, which sometimes is a rarity. So for the, the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors, we have three general advisors and we're the ones who connect producers to resources and organize networking events and workshops and such. Um, we have Danny Smart, you wanna give a wave there? Danny's based in Kimberly and she's a general advisor for KBFA and Andrew Bennett, give us a wave. Also, um, Andrew's been with KBFA for six years, also a general advisor. And the only face I'm missing is our faithful communications coordinator who helps us um, strategize how to get the word out to all you lovely folks. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the controls over to Jeff and take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. I'll just ask for confirmation that things are coming through clearly. It looks great. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks very much, Rachel. It's As um, you mentioned, it's a, a great opportunity for us to um, interact as well. And um, I think one of the other things as far as like reasons why to do something like this for, for our ministry, it's also a chance to get input back. And, and as we roll out programs and as we try and connect people with things that are helpful for them, it's always um, beneficial for us to hear how things are going and, and, and what people are looking for from the ministry, because it, it can sort of change year to year what's being delivered. So hopefully a little bit of a two-way street and we've got a pretty uh, intimate group here this morning. So um, I think we should have lots of questions or lots of opportunity for, um, uh, yeah, that type of discussion, if that's something you're looking for. And, and Jeff, you know what I forgot is to do our round table of introductions. I introduced Andrew and Danny, but 
perhaps we can just have Dale, Emma, and Justine uh, introduce themselves. Oh, and Elizabeth is here too. Um, just so Phil also knows who's in the room today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Rachel, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of a uh, audience on this presentation. Uh, for everyone's information, I farm just north of Golden, and, and uh, so I think I'm uh, probably uh, furthest north of the group here today. And in fact, some people say, what do you mean? You do farming up in Golden? Well, you bet we do. Uh, we're just a little higher than some folks, in elevation, that is. So uh, looking forward to the presentation this morning. Thanks again, Rachel. I guess I can go next. Um, my name is Justine Cohen, and I'm a manager with Columbia Basin Trust. So I most recently, um, I'm, a re I'm relatively new to the trust and most recently have moved into the local food production and access portfolio. And so Jeff and I've had a chance to connect and meet. So good to see you, Jeff. And Rachel, I've seen your, I've seen your names around. We haven't had the, the pleasure of meeting face to face yet, but uh, yeah, looking forward to the presentation. Um, my name is Emma and uh, we farm just two acres of mixed veg outside of Nelson, um, kind of your mixed market garden type of thing. And I've accessed ministry funding in the past, and, and I'm curious about what's coming forward and what's uh, what's happening. Great. Thanks for joining us, Emma. And just also wanted to let folks know that you are the chair of the Kootenai Organic Growers Society. That's true. So, yeah, That's you, you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're a great uh, liaison for COGS. So, that, you know, you and I communicate a lot of we want to get word out to the organic sector. And the COGS AGM is on February 6th in Nelson. And there's going to be a great lineup of presenters at that event. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. All right. And I will pass this on. Who's the next on my list? Is it there's Amanda? Hi. Hi, I'm Amanda. I have an eight acre farm in Salmo. We are in the midst of opening a really small sheep and goat dairy. Um, and it's incredibly, incredibly expensive. So we're <laughs> hoping uh, to find a little bit of help there. Just got another $20,000 quote today. So um, yeah, we raise um, dairy, sheep, and goats, and then we also raise them out for meat. Um, and then uh, we have a half acre market garden. We also do um, quail eggs and um, chicken eggs, and we run a CSA. Fantastic, thanks for joining today, Amanda. It's nice to see you. Thanks, Rachel. And Elizabeth? Uh, hi, um, my name is Elizabeth Brown. Um, Technically, I grew up in Creston um, on a dairy farm that we moved from the coast in back in 2011, but uh, now I just have a few beef on the side, but I actually work for Bayer Crop Science, and for me, this is keeping up to date on what's going on with everybody else and their farms, so. Great. That's really interesting. You work with Bayer and Cranbrook. I'm familiar with their operations and it's like doing some really high end agricultural technical work out there. So that must be an interesting job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get to see quite a few of the different sites around here. Absolutely. And I noticed that we have Robbie join. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or if you have that ability. There's no pressure. But Robbie, if you want to introduce yourself, go ahead. They're also just joining a meeting, so they're plunged into the deep end. <laughs> All right, I'll let you take it, away, take it from here, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for introducing yourselves. Sure, and thanks, Rachel. And, and uh, as it um, noted on the slide here, please do feel free to, if a lot of what we're, Phil and I are going to be sharing today, um, it's kind of just the quickest intro. There's, the ministry has sort of an overwhelming number of things going on in some areas. And um, and 
So it's partly just to give a sense of what's out there. And um, if, if there are things that tweak interest, please feel free to ask. And then um, also just a big reason for today is to familiarize yourselves with Phil and I, and, and you can reach out to us afterwards if, if you want sort of that, that real extra deep dive in some of this. But um, essentially what we wanted to do was go over and introduce um, the agrologists that you have access to in our region and um, kind of touch on what our ministry's big picture stuff is. So what the, the mandate of the ministry is and, and some of the priority areas that we have overview of some of the types of programs that are offered or services that, that the ministry provides. And then um, finally try and get to a bit of, if you're thinking about sort of what is accessible to you now, um, what that might look like. And, um, and a lot of that, uh, if, if we were talking six months from now, that would probably look very different. <laughs> um, but we'll, uh, we'll at least let you know what, what's on the, on the radar sort of currently. So um, just to kind of quickly provide a, a little bit of an overview of what's, what the ministry is and, and who some of the folks are within it. Um, there's internally, we have all sorts of, of structures and, and sort of organizations, but really when it com what it comes down to is that it is a big group of people. There's um, folks like Phil and myself who are agrologists and we work uh, mostly on the sort of that frontline part of the ministry. And some of us are regionally based. So we look after a certain geographic area. And then that means we kind of just do whatever comes up with, within that region. Other staff within the ministry are really focused on, say, one commodity. So there may be a specialist, an agrologist specialist that focuses squarely on berries. Then um, we also have uh, specialists that look after sort of specific resources. So there's a provincial soil specialist, and that, that agrologist is focused on dealing with soil management across the province as it relates to agriculture. So there's a few different kinds of roles that the agrologists fill within the ministry, but um, the, the folks you've got on the line here are the ones who are, uh, we have, we look after a certain region. And then there's other sort of jobs within the ministry that, um, we have land use planners who look after sort of how um, a lot of that is support directly to local governments. There's folks that work um, in our plant and animal health center. Um, we have folks that, fo or that they focus on, on marketing development, largely sort of international markets. And, and then within the food safety realm, our ministry actually has some regulatory role within um, food safety and processing. So um, it's quite a different section of the, the ministry, but um, it's a, a space where there are experts over there as well. So all sorts of different kinds of, of people within the ministry. And at the end of the day though, for most farms, um, there's points of contact that you can reach out to. And, and those tend to be the regional agrologists. And what we can sort of um, provide is access to that network. and. Uh, our, uh, within the regional agrologist network, we also bring sort of our own specialization. So we all land in these weird jobs um, after some sort of process of getting to this point. And so we can, a lot of the regional agrologists have kind of wildly different backgrounds in agrology. So that might mean that someone has a really strong focus on integrated pest management, or it might be someone like myself, I tend to have a little bit more of a background in soil and nutrient management. So, um, Across the province, we all have these sort of different areas of, of expertise. Um, and, uh, and it is something that we can share across that network. So if I don't know um, something about pest management, it is something that I can access through the different regional agrologists or our specialists that focus entirely on that topic. So um, it's, it's a, a resource that, especially in our modern era where we can get instant communication back from all these specialists that are, um, all over the place. It, it doesn't mean that we're stuck with just who's physically in our region, which other, otherwise that'd be a, a really small number of people, as you'll see. So um, essentially the, the role that, that both Phil and I have uh, as a, a regional agrologist, um, you know, are, we are that sort of frontline contact. We're the most sort of out there staff, I would say. Uh, as far as a resource for farmers and, and other the general public that are looking to interact with the ministry. And so we work with local governments, so the regional districts and the, the towns within our region, um, 
if there's industry groups that are centered in our region or producer sort of associations, farmers institutes, we help them work on just sort of overall what their priorities are and if there's ways to support that. And then kind of look to generally, you know, we are uh, public servants and the minister is has a, a mandate of, of what they're looking to achieve in, within their term. And, and our roles as public servants is to try and help that move along. So um, along the way, we're trying to help steer sort of according to that vision. Yeah, Jeff, and I'll just add in, in the province, uh, as a regional agrologist, there are 17 of us mm-hmm. doing this job, all regionally based. So from Fort St. John, uh, Prince George in the north, uh, to Vancouver Island, where there are three posted, to the Lower Mainland, and then the Okanagan, the Kootenays. So there's 17 regional agrologists, like the title that we have, and we're all professional agrologists with the BC Institute of Agrology. So that's where our professionalism comes into it. And then, as Jeff was saying, like we're really that network from uh, the ministry side that sort of promotes our ministry mandates, whether that's uh, climate change, uh, environmental sustainable practices, food production, and then um, taking that network and sort of being the liaison between the producers, uh, those people like the KBFA and the associations, and really trying to direct where we think, or well, where, where the ministry money is at, where our budgets are at but trying to push that forward with, uh, with the groups that we have contact with. Bill, do you want to carry on the last couple of roles, roles on this agrologist? Sure. Yeah. And, and that's um, when I, so I started this job about a year and a half ago and, and Jeff was in the ministry of agriculture before, but came into the regional agrologist role. It was definitely a little bit of a black box for me too. I'm like, this regional agrologist really is not well defined. What is it actually? And so I know there's a lot of people who ask that question outside of the ministry too. Um, and yeah, we are that that frontline contact, and we are the person. So if you went to say Agri Service BC or you had a question that you wanted to ask the ministry, it would definitely come to us first, and then we use sort of our knowledge or our skills, whether it's looking for someone within the Ministry of Agriculture or we can answer some of those general inquiries we are sort of that we want to be that go-to person for producers to ask those initial questions yeah whether it is uh sort of more technical or it's about programming or how to access money and then uh, another part of our job is working with local governments and helping them direct or make decisions on some of their their zoning or their planning when it comes to their official community plan um, and also where if there may be decisions for ALR land or ALC applications within a certain region. So that's quite a bit of what I do. And then also sort of the not glamorous portion of the job is we tend to be um, sort of the front line for c- complaints as well. So whether it's farm practices for neighbor to neighbor or if it is sort of that urban interface, we generally try and help resolve that without um, getting anything like the Farm Industry Review Board involved. So we tend to be that frontline contact for complaints and also inquiries and try and just generally deal with things um, for taking it to any next levels, which we as regional agrologists don't have a part in the kind of enforcement or compliance. We more just, uh, as an example on the slide here, it says compliance concerns. Someone... Uh, was leasing a property in the Okanagan and was wondering about if they could lay um, some dirty hay down or used hay, I guess, uh, for paths for their horses uh, in the wintertime, which, you know, working through the legislation, I was able to just give them some advice about, hey, this is what the legislation says, and maybe this is how you might be able to direct your practices differently. Um, Other than that, when the floods came, through the Fraser Valley and in the Merritt Princeton area. We were sort of called in to help deal with that on a ministry level. And then wildfires as well. We tend to work with regional districts and local governments to help the agricultural community access funding, whether it's transporting livestock, evacuations, uh, finding food or hay. We've been there to help the agricultural community in times of that emergency management side. And then again, like linkages and uh, specialists with other agencies. So a lot of uh, the the 
ministries within the BC Public Service have different professionals, and Jeff and I are sort of the knowledgeable people to know how to link those or make connections. Uh, an example for the Kootenai Boundary Area and the Kootenays is Jeff and I sit on a drought working group that helps uh, determine the level of drought that we're in and what sort of um, like what sort of precautions or actions may be need- needed to take in from the agricultural community when we're in drought conditions. So just a, just a couple examples of what we do on our day to day. All right. And so our kind of people focused <laughs> um, within the, the Kootenai boundary kind of zone, uh, there's, Two, agro- or two of us that, that look after this region. So um, essentially I, I look after the, the Kootenai region, which tends, our, our general dis- description of that is um, kind of matches the Columbia Basin essentially. So um, that's probably the, the easiest way to describe that if, if anyone's um, wondering about a specific sort of edge of that space, <laughs> you can always reach out, but um, we do, it's it's not a sort of hard and fast rule depending on where someone is if there is someone that's a little closer um there is an agrologist up in vernon that sometimes we we work with on for some of the folks that are um by car a little closer than i actually am if, if there's a need for site visits but that's the region that i look after and um i'm based in creston at uh, there's a service bc office on on the main drag in creston you're welcome to if i'm not or if i'm in the office i'm would be happy to say hi if you feel like stopping by. Um, and yeah, I guess just as a bit of an intro of, of, of who I am and how I landed here, um, I've been with the ministry for, I think, about six years now. Um, initially, I joined um, the ministry as a nutrient management specialist, so focused mostly on sort of how fertilizers and manure are used on farm and, 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 and so as a resource specialist with the, the team that's based out of the Abbotsford office. And uh, so, yeah, I worked there for quite a while um, in a couple of different roles, mostly focused in, in that space, but um, the, the chance came up to move back to Creston. Um, I, I had lived here uh, previously for a little bit as well. So I was pretty keen to come back. Um, and so, yeah, when, when uh, there was a, a retirement here, as Rachel mentioned, and so I, I made the move back to, to Creston and, and uh, switched to a, re- a role with a regional focus. Um, maybe uh, a random tidbit I heard, um, I think it was, it might have been Amanda mentioned, one of my first jobs in agriculture was looking after some quail barns. So, um, yeah, uh, just weird things that we do that eventually land us in where we are. But um, yeah, I'm sure uh, I'll pass it over to Phil. You can uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. So Philip Juke, for those of you who, uh, well, I don't uh, I think a lot of new faces here. And I am the regional agrologist for the South Okanagan, the Similkameen and the Kootenai boundary. And that's where Jeff and I have some of that overlap is in the Kootenai, Kootenai boundary. So sometimes, like Jeff said, there's no hard or fast rules. If there's maybe a question or a farmer who's asking something where I feel Jeff could answer better, or if it's somewhere that Jeff could drive like Grand Forks quicker than I could, sometimes we'll just collaborate and sort of take on these areas together. Um, and with that, yeah, I am born and raised in the Okanagan. Also went to school here for an earth and environmental science degree at UBCO. And after that, I went out to Alberta, Saskatchewan to chase work. And that led me into the environmental consulting of oil and gas and utilities, which then had a lot of crossover with the farmers, the private landowners who uh, all this oil and gas activity is going on. So uh, environmental impact assessments, pre-disturbance assessments on farmland in some of those sensitive or protected ecosystems on these farms. So there's generally a lot more private land there than there is in BC versus a lot of crown land here. And with that sort of became realized, you know what, prairies, not for me as much as I thought it was. That's where my family emigrated to, but 
it was time to come back to uh, BC and the Okanagan. So I actually worked for the Ministry of Forests as a range agrologist for the last four and a half years out of merit with the Ministry of Forests there. So that was a great uh, experience with the, the livestock and the range world. And uh, a year and a half ago, so basically when COVID came, I was able to come into the position as a regional agrologist in the Okanagan. So still working on some of the knowledge around tree fruits and grapes, as obviously that's quite a big thing here. But in the Kootenai boundary, I know there's more diversification and with the livestock sector and some of the other things going on there. So that's a bit of my history. That's how I got here. And I'm, I'm super happy in this role. And yeah. Like I said, just it's it's a bit of a, a generalist role as a regional agrologist, and we really just try to connect the dots between stuff going on within the ministry, the associations, and the uh, single farmers. Yeah, and I, I guess um, just other random tidbit on our, on our slide here is both Phil and I are on a team that's um, kind of Okanagan Kootenai based, and uh, the. There's another regional agrologist on that team that looks after more of the Okanagan area, as well as um, the different specialists that focus on tree fruit and grapes. So it's kind of a mixed team of, of uh, some of our staff. And our boss is Adrian. So uh, to, to get a little more specific into what are some of the things that uh, the ministry has that are accessible to farmers for support services or actual programs themselves. I think we'll start off with um, general, some of the big picture mandate things that the ministry has been driving for the last little while. And, and so I, several years ago, the there was a, a real, and a lot of this, I think, started off when um, we had a new minister um, uh, at, with uh, Lana Popham, um, who actually just recently was, um, changed to a different file. So we actually have a brand new minister, Minister Pam Alexis. Um, but uh, the grow feed by kind of push was a, a pretty um, big uh, change for the ministry at a certain point. And, and, and uh, the biggest part of that, that our teams kind of dealt with is the grow BC. And a lot of that was just sort of how our ministry um, constructs programs that support production in a sustainable way. Um, the feed BC portion tends to focus more on how BC products can be used in some of our BC institutions and then by BC a really strong push on, on marketing and bringing back that sort of quite old um, logo for marketing BC products. Um, but usually um, for, for most producers, buy BC and, and, and grow BC are where they might have points of contact and grow BC is kind of just the, the overarching idea of let's have programs that help people grow. And there's also been in the last few years, a few different other priority areas that um, have been brought up within the ministry. And, and most recently, I think one of those is the, uh, a change in how a lot of our environmental and, and climate change programs are, are rolling out. Um, and so we'll, I'll be quick with this because this is kind of high level, but in case you're interested in the upper workings of this, but um, really there's a, a, over the past few years, um, the, the climate adaptation programming, a lot of that's been delivered through this model that was kind of built up from the regions. And so the, there were committees that helped establish how the different priorities within these, within these regions laid out and, and then that built into what different programs, what projects are delivered in, in order to respond to climate change. And that model is kind of being merged into a lot of our other environmental programming in the next little bit. And so over the next five years, I think that will mean a change. And, and within our ministry, that's referred to as this regional extension model of how we interact with our stakeholders across the regions to deliver a lot of our programming. So it's a bit of a shift for some of the program areas. and. Um, hopefully means better kind of connection with the people that these programs are helping. So the other thing that the ministry um, through the last several mandate letters has been kind of working towards is, is um, increasing the presence and, 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 and use of regenerative agriculture practices within the province. It's kind of an overarching priority through a lot of our programs and certainly sustainable production has, has 
been for a long time an emphasis in a lot of our different programs. So, you know, soil health is woven into a lot of the environmental farm plan, but the, the broad emphasis of, of regenerative agriculture is a lot more in the spotlight. There's an, an established advisory committee for the minister on this and, and um, eventually there's a, a team that's kind of being built out at the moment to, to deliver a lot of that work. So big picture things that, um, that uh, affect sort of how some of the day-to-day -day programs work. But um, so uh, maybe more specifically, what, what are some of these things? Um, there are different sort of uh, programs that are around, but there's also different projects that result in resources or tools that people can have access to. And um, we've got uh, different specialists that work on things like a decision support tool. So if you're looking at, you know, how much irrigation water might you expect to need? And some of that might connect with your water licensing or just your general, how much are you expected to use? There's water tools that have been developed to assess, uh, help with that. Same deal with um, soil and nutrient management, how to work with some of your soil test results and, and how to plan for, for nutrient use. There's um, resources that are available in, to, to address that or, um, if you're wondering what forages might be suited to your intended use or region, again, there's um, the ministry's worked on different options to, to try and address that. And Phil, I don't if you're able to to paste some of the URLs in our, mm -hmm. our Zoom chat. Yeah, um, I just pasted some of those in. Awesome, thanks. And, uh, yeah, so these are these are some links that would go to say the water management support tools or some of the uh, soil and management and nutrient information. So. If you feel free to copy those links and put them in your browser and that'll take you on a, I guess, a new little adventure. <laughs> and certainly um, we'll follow all of the, anything that's kind of shared in this way, we can follow up afterwards with a, a, a email to through the KBFA to kind of to circle back to that. There's also um, in all of our ministry programs are listed on kind of one website, which is can be a little overwhelming and we'll highlight a few of them in the, in, our, our talk today, but um, the the URL that's up top there is where most of those are housed, and um, so feel free to check that out as well. The ministry does have some, I, I guess, like technical services, or, or you know, you can bring stuff in, have it assessed, and 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 um, and so did just want to highlight. Um, this is uh, based in our Abbotsford office. There's both a, a plant health laboratory and the animal health center. And so really the, a lot of the role of those two labs is, is diagnosis. And so if you have um, a suspicion about certain, say you've got disease that's affecting a certain portion of your crop, um, the role of the plant health lab is you know, assessing uh, what that might be. There's plant pathologists that will review that and um, and then get back to you with a diagnosis. Those are all run on a fee-for-service basis. And um, if you're interested, uh, there's... Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something, but uh, we're good. Um, so yeah, there, there's uh, descriptions of the plant submission process on, on the website for the Plant Health Laboratory. And same goes for the Animal Health Center. It's um, quite a facility based in Abbotsford. They do a lot of diagnosis. Um, they're heavily involved in, in the the avian influenza response, but also they provide services for veterinarians if, you, if they're looking to diagnose what's going on with an animal. Um, typically, a lot of that intake, it's, it's um, probably done in consultation with a veterinarian, but can be done with a producer as well. So um, certainly another resource that it's, it's far from our region, but is something that we have access to. And um, the Animal Health Center does also look after bees as well. So if you have some problems with some of your bees, um, for be producers in BC, it's a free service. So you can um, just make sure you have at least 50 and you can mail them into the lab, label it bees and away you go. Um, they'll um, can diagnose things like if you have a mite infestation or, or what some of those things might encounter. One of the really common questions we get is if the ministry does soil testing, do we have a lab that's sort of that provincial standard for how, how soils analysis is done? Um, that's, of quite a long time ago, that type of service was phased out. So there is no provincial lab that looks after soil testing that the province um, has for agronomics. There's, there are some, within the Ministry of Environment, they have some lab facilities, but um, they're not sort of geared towards farming uh, with no sort of agronomic recommendations provided with that. So our ministry has no laboratory services for soil testing, um, or, or is that sort of carry on to agronomic advice on that front? Um, 
uh, maybe just as a tidbit, if you do submit some plant samples with root mass to the, the, the plant health laboratory, um, they may do some analysis on pH and electrical conductivity for you as, as just to sort of diagnose what's going on with the plant. So it's, I think the only remaining place where you could have some kind of soils analysis done. So otherwise just we're, we're gonna go through a couple programs to highlight, but um, really there's a whole slew of, of Ministry of Agriculture programs that accompany all the different services or tools that are developed to support farmers. So some of these are delivered by other sort of delivery groups. So something you might notice on here would be the land matching program, which is actually delivered by the young agrarians. And really they look after that entirely for um, like they're, they're running that program. It's just something that the ministry has funded as a part of the, that priority for, for supporting new entrants to, to farming. Um, same, same idea with the environmental farm plan. It's not something the ministry delivers, but it's supported by the ministry through funding and sort of background technical support. Other things on here, like the, um, you know, our aggregate agribusiness planning program or um, by BC, those are things that are delivered by the ministry. And so there's program staff in the ministry that actually run these programs. Won't go through all these, but if you see a name on here that is really of interest, feel free to, to ask us about, about that detail. Otherwise, we'll, Phil and I will kind of just bounce back and forth highlighting a few of the different programs that are examples of things that the ministry delivers. And I think, Phil, if you want to take away okay. on some. Yeah, this, this one gives me here. So one of the programs that we'd like to highlight for you guys, and this one, since I started with the ministry, has been uh, quite a consistent one with a couple intakes per year. So a spring intake and a fall intake. And what I mean for that is with the knowledge and technology transfer, there, there's been a pot of money to help with um, with transferring knowledge and technology. So subject matter experts um, with knowledge development. There's also been uh, a stream for hands-on learning and that's knowledge and skill development. So you're looking at like field days or farm tours, um, something that's hands-on and more uh, something you can experience in person. And then we also have a third stream that's focused on regenerative agriculture. And that regenerative agriculture, again, is uh, a cost-shared funding source that helps uh, bring in or uh, look at field days, farm tours, and those hands-on workshops. So with this KTTP program, uh, the application isn't open right now, but when they do come up, which has generally been a spring and a fall intake, we try and get the word out there through a few of our different uh, like email sources or news sources. So often we'll let uh, KBFA know that, hey, the KTT program has an intake open right now. So please send out to your members. And then with that, generally, it's, it's good if you had an idea like, oh, I would love to show off something on my farm. Or, oh, I think this would be a great person to listen to. And how can I help line that up? You can just call uh, Jeff or myself and we can sort of talk about, okay, how would that look like? What would you maybe like to do or help facilitate this? And then where can we work on that cost share to bring in a subject matter expert or to help you host a, a farm tour on your farm? So we, we really like to hear ideas and then we can help uh, facilitate that or make it come to fruition like with the whole application process that has to get done. So there's with the KTTP, uh, some of those funding sources, they have different dollar amounts associated to them. So the subject matter expert is a $1,500 uh, cost share, up to $1,500. And uh, that can be through like cash in kind or donation. Um, with the hands-on learning, there's up to $7,500 for cost sharing. And that, again, was for like a field day or doing a farm tour, bringing people to your farm, et cetera. So yeah, like I said, there, this has been a consistent one where there's been a couple intakes each year. And this is one where stay tuned as probably in April would be my guess is when uh, a spring intake may come out. So if you have ideas, definitely Jeff and I are the people to reach out to first and just we can uh, go from there. 
and the contact is on the presentation here. So the best way is to just email uh, this general email at knowledge.transfer at gov.bc.ca and that would go to uh, the knowledge transfer team. Yeah, I think um, the an example of this one would be uh, this past season, um, it, based on the sort of the East Kootenai, the wild site delivered a, a few um, essentially vegetable production courses and uh, uh, the, the program was supported through the, the knowledge transfer uh, program. And then, yeah, one of the other um, flagship programs that the, the ministry um, kind of supports and then has another agency deliver is the Environmental Farm Plan Program. And um, we're kind of benefiting from the presence of two planning advisors on, on in our discussion here as well today. But um, generally, this, this program is really all about um, education. So how, how farms interact with the environment, and then also how they are, are doing with respect to um, different legislations and, and rules within the province, and, and if there's opportunities to, to move forward on, on environmental sustainability. And so um, I think probably the, the success of this program really does lie in in-person support. Someone will come to your farm and work through this with you. And so it, it provides that sort of planning advisor interaction with the farm, for the farmer. And then eventually through, um, assessing the different environmental risks on your farm, um, you can access funding to help uh, work at those. Uh, generally, um, the, the program is sort of confidential, so it's not delivered by the ministry. So you can have someone come and have a safe space to discuss environmental uh, sort of regulations or, or some of the different things that might be occurring on your farm, and it's free. So having someone visit and do the actual environmental farm plan um, doesn't cost anything to, for the producer. So as I mentioned, um, that pro process of sort of environmental risk assessment is to help you set, help set you up for what can you do to make improvements on farm if there are some. And if there are some to be made, there's a sort of partner program that allows you to access funding from the province as well as the federal government um, to make those changes. And so a lot of those focus on environmental benefit. Um, a lot of them do connect with sort of co-production benefits. So, you know, a lot of things like soil health is a really easy example of something that there's environmental benefits to it, but building soil health on farm really does have that really strong connection with production benefit too. So um, there's opportunity to, to, to get into um, different kinds of projects through the BMP program. And um, once we go through the different timelines of different things, I'll, I'll, I'll lean on, on Rachel or Andrew to kind of um, give a sense of when to interact with this program in order to, to set yourself up for success. Okay, so thanks, Jeff. And continuing on with some of the programs that we uh, have just wrapped up for the 2022 season. And is there a chance these continue? The Extreme Weather Preparedness for Agriculture program was a pilot in 2022. And it's now closed, but there's a probable chance that that one will continue with funding from the federal government as well as the province under what will probably be the, the new Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Um, so this one, it it really came out of the last few years where there's just been some, such crazy weather with wildfire, flooding, and extreme heat. So that's really what this one is looking to tackle. And there's a, a host, host of <clears throat> eligibility requirements for this one. However, um, it's like I, like a lot of these programs if you come to Jeff or myself, we have the contacts with the people within the ministry who are running these programs. And then we can also help provide some general information if you were thinking about applying for something yourself or just wanted to know more about it. So there's generally been a couple intakes for the extreme weather preparedness as well. And like I said, it was uh, targeting wildfires, flooding, and extreme heat. And that's for on farm uh, climate preparedness or to climate um, resiliency and it can be from everything I think one of the ones was like even just planting trees and creating shade for your animals or working on different water developments for your livestock 
Um, so there's, yeah, there's a host of things in there and that's one program that uh, I think will be renewed and coming up again. The, and the hazelnut renewal program. So uh, like the bold says, it was uh, a program that was completed in 2022 and there were uh, plantings all throughout the, well, the, I think there was the island and full in the Okanagan and in the Kootenays. And these people were able to plant new trees that were brought in through this program and remove old ones and to sort of get a hazelnut uh, program or a hazelnut industry back up and running. So that was a successful one. And this is a, a to be determined if, if there will be another one for that. But just an example of a program where uh, we really tried to get an industry back up and going. All right, um, we'll probably be kind of high level on these ones, but uh, essentially there's a, a few different areas within marketing that the, the ministry has programs that run. So the Agri-Seafood and, and Market Development Program is just wrapping up this year. Um, it's major emphasis has been on international markets and um, was an opportunity for people to, to, to work with IAF and a contractor to, to try and assess what's out there and, and, and share some of the costs that might be associated with that. Um, it's possible that new iterations of this might be a, a little more um, just proposal based. I'm not sure that it will carry on in the, in the same format again, but um, the, I think one thing that uh, proposal based might introduce is that one tended to really focus on that international space, but um, proposals might introduce an opportunity to, if you are interested in a little better understanding of local markets, which can be really difficult to get actual research data on, um, that might introduce a, a bit of an opportunity for, for that if, if it were supported through that program. Then um, BIBC is, has been the sort of the champion marketing program for a while as well for the ministry. There's opportunity to, to, uh, to license it and use the BIBC logo on your product to, to really sort of advertise local production if that's something you're interested in. And, and uh, not something that's open at the moment, but um, I think was had a lot of uptake and usually that's something that can guide whether we would expect something to carry on again, um, is that opportunity to cost share um, some marketing and promo activities if you're if you are one of the BBC licensed producers. So definitely had some um, folks within the region make use of that sort of market sharing their promo their promo activities activities through BBC. So um, one to watch if if it does open up again. I think. Okay, and so here we have insurance and income protect protection programs. And this is run through a different branch than Jeff and I's. It's the business risk management branch. And they have a whole suite of insurance and income stability programs. So we just thought we'd highlight a couple of the ones that um, are fairly big and quite popular with a lot of producers. And so the production insurance, uh, it's, it's sort of like an affordable insurance that helps support agricultural producers to manage crop losses. Um, so you can see there if there was uh, excessive rain or flooding, drought, they're able to help sort of cover the losses that you incurred from whatever event that would be. And uh, like the bullet says there, the production insurance is offered to uh, berries, grain, forage, grapes, tree fruits, vegetables, and I think uh, flower bulbs as well. So that's that's one that uh, Business First Venture Branch offers. And then AgriStability. So AgriStability is a tool that sort of protects people against large income declines. So say something happened where there was, you have like an average price over a few years, you weren't able to get that, AgriStability would kick in. And it's based on sort of the income expenses that you would have expected and help sort of buffer uh, what decline you may have seen. And for the Kootenays, the, uh, the office that services the Kootenays is an Oliver. And in that bullet there, I've just got the Oliver's main or the front reception line. And they also, AgriStability has a general email that you can forward and, and someone would get back to you there. So not sure if any of you have uh, already enrolled in these or have thought about it. 
but definitely there's a whole branch to support these suite of sort of insurance programs and they're open at any time. So there's not like there's intake windows. Um, you just have to make sure that if anything were to happen that you already have these prior. I know in 2021, after the wildfires, they held <clears throat> agri stability open for an extra year so that you could apply and you wouldn't have gotten the full reimbursement of if you were already enrolled, but they did have uh, a delayed time period where you could enroll and still cover some of the losses from the 2021 wildfires when that sort of ravaged a lot of different areas. So yeah, just an important number to write down and, and there's a whole team there that are able to help you out. Right, and then uh, another area of, of sort of emphasis within the ministry has been um, supporting new entrants to agriculture. And so there's a few different sort of programs and, and resources that are built up around around that. So um, within uh, the new entrants group, there's, um, I think I already kind of mentioned, there's the ministry supports um, the delivery of the land matching program by the young agrarians. So folks, if it's sort of that matching role of if you have land and want someone to farm it, or if um, you're looking for land and, 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 and want sort of, um, rather than making the initial investment, you wanna um, work with someone to see if you can um, use their land for farming, that's sort of facilitated by that program. And then a few different uh, uh, options for just paper resources or, or, or digital resources is, are some guides for, for new producers and all of the different things that they might um, want to consider before they dive into it or once they're just starting up. And um, I think the other area that um, the strategy that was developed on this front that was quite successful um, within the um, this team was the Small Farm Business Acceleration Pilot Program. And so that was a pilot of um, helping people access capital basically for some of those initial investments that really drive uh, a small farm business forward. And sometimes it can be a, a quite a, a big thing to invest in upfront and, and that program supported some small businesses to, to make some investment on farm. Um, it's up for kind of, uh, I, I think there's a lot of interest in seeing that, that program continue and, and uh, I, uh, one that we haven't heard the, the the formal yes it's going forward again but um, based on the popularity or sort of the interest in it would would really expect to see sort of a new iteration I think the the team behind it was pretty excited to kind of take the pilot year and, and incorporate a little bit more um, sort of how there's uh, follow through with some of, of those farms and, and and look at sort of the business opportunities that were built from from those investments and, and use that to to guide how that program would would deliver in future. So uh, one to watch, I would say, even if we don't have a, a sort of formal announcement around it. Yeah, Jeff, and if I could just add um, sort of two facets in-house, like within the Ministry of Agriculture, we have a dedicated full-time person who is mm -hmm. new entrant agrologist. And uh, it's someone that we can either provide her contact or uh, reach out to us. And we can always get a hold of her because uh being this, you know, it's quite important to get new people started and have the resources there. And there's within the ministry, we do have a full-time person and quite a few sort of like handbooks or resources on that getting started. And then just like KBFA, uh, there's a few different networks outside of the ministry that are really great for providing some of that advisory support or to help um, sort of give you the first few steps and in, in where to go as a new entrant. So yeah, it's, it's one that we definitely believe in supporting and uh, one of the successful ones that we did in the last couple of years was that small farm business acceleration that just helped in, put in some money for, I know in, in the Okanagan, it was helping a few people build their new greenhouses, uh, retrofit, some sea cans and trailers to help with cool storage for getting to and from farmers markets. So definitely like a good place just to get people off the ground. All right. And so the ministry does also have business planning resources. Phil, I can't remember if I was going to do this one or you, but yeah, I think you were going to tackle it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so the ministry does have uh, a few different business planning sort of options and um, 
largely what this does is um, it cost shares act, um, the um, a producer's sort of consultant to help them work through this. And so there's a list of different consultants across the province that can participate in this program and support farmers on business, like just fundamental business planning, but also some of, if you are moving through that program process, you can access different sort of facets of, of how your business works. And so um, it doesn't necessarily just have to be the full, uh, that core business plan, but if someone were looking to focus specifically on just something like succession and how that will look for their farm and, and what their plan will be for that, um, they can access support through the, the program for something like that. Um, uh, sort of a, a similarly structured program is the BC Indigenous Agriculture Development Program, and, and really that has a similar focus of, of helping um, specifically Indigenous enterprise and entrepreneurs or else um, First Nations communities and organizations to, to provide that sort of support and planning and, and, and working through what they want to achieve um, in their agribusiness venture. Um, the ministry has a, a, another sort of um, program that's this year has started up through the Investment Agriculture Foundation as well, that really looks at sort of indigenous agriculture projects um, and how they contribute to sort of food security. And, and it's probably a bit more expansive than the, the program that's listed on the slide here. So if, if uh, anyone on the call has connections um, with any of any First Nations sort of entrepreneurs or communities and, and is looking to drive projects like that forward, there are some quite specific opportunities there. And, and definitely one, there's a, a, a team of, of a few different uh, advisors within the ministry that focus squarely in that space. Um, maybe just, I mean, there's, it's an area within the region as well that um, our ministry isn't the only one that offers this service. So I, I think um, one thing to, to, to sort of, if you're speaking with, with, a regional agrologist is um, we're probably most familiar with our programs, but there, you know, there's basin business advisors as well. Nairi within our region that, that work specifically with farmers. And so it's kind of a, there's a bit of a choice for producers who to, who to work with. And so we'll try and make you aware of, of what's open to farmers. And, and this is an option, whether you use ministry services or, or something that's more regionally based is um, yeah. For folks to decide. And yeah, let's dig into um, sort of specifics of, of what's going on now. <laughs> because uh, you probably heard a, a common thread through a lot of those programs that we were talking about was um, it's something that had been delivered and, and, and was kind of wrapping up. And, and one of the reasons there is a lot of the funding for agriculture in the province comes through what's um, the, the logo on the bottom right of the screen here, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Um, it's a, an agreement between the provinces and the federal government to, as, and it provides a huge investment in, in agriculture and really delivers a lot of things like even our production insurance, our environmental programming, there's a whole suite of what goes on in agriculture in the ministry that's a result of, of the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. And so every five years, that's renegotiated between the province and the federal government and it establishes what the different areas of priority are and um, and the actual amounts of money that get directed to those different priority areas. So um, it does mean that there's a little bit of a limbo in between um, the five-year cycles where, you know, if, if there's one area of priority that changes and um, often it, it means programs have to kind of pause until we know what the specific um, opportunities are to, to move into the next funding cycle. And so, um, Right now is kind of that phase where there's a lot of programs wrapping up because that five year funding cycle is finishing and reviewing whether that's something the province wants to push to move forward. And then if it sort of aligning it to make sure it meets what the federal and national priorities are within support for agriculture. So um, that's a long winded way of saying a lot of stuff is kind of just in this pause phase where we're looking to see um, what happens with the development of the Canadian Agricultural Partnership for sort of um, the next round. And um, our ministry has sort of undertaken a, a few different ways to try and get feedback into that as well. Um, a lot of it goes through industry associations and the BC Agricultural Council, but um, we just are trying to better inform a lot of our programs anyway on, on what should be delivered. And so there's been um, uh, I think recently, uh, if you participated in some of our programs already, probably got bombarded with a, a survey at the end of the year um, with respect to how programs run and, and where people see um, um, see opportunities for future work. So um, 
it does mean we're kind of in that sort of end of term phase. And so when we look at what programs actually have open intakes right now, um, the list, it, it does mean we're at kind of a, a, a small list of things that you have an opportunity to engage with. So um, a lot of that means it's sort of programs that have, um, that are funded outside of that um, cap partnership or else just things that have ongoing intakes where we just know it's gonna, it's really likely that that will continue anyway. So um, certainly the, the by BC local licensing program, something that just carries on year round, it doesn't have a specific window. You can um, work with that team to make use of the by BC logo. Um, and uh, the environmental farm plan, um, it's the actual access to a planning advisor and having them work through that environmental risk assessment is something that, um, that can happen year round. And, and maybe I'll, I'll, if I can ask, um, I don't know if Rachel or Andrew who, who wants to volunteer for this, um, the companion program for, um, for the environmental farm plan, the beneficial management practices program that funds a lot of the projects that you might want to take on. Um, there's no open windows for that right now, but um, maybe, and um, if one of you would, wouldn't mind giving some advice on how to um, interact with that program to set yourself up for a good application once those windows do open up. And Jeff, um, thank you. I'm just, I'm sending the controls over to Andrew so he can actually share his screen oh, so he perfect. can show the IAF platform um, to familiarize um, everybody on this uh, call with, with how people go about applying for the environmental farm plan and also the BMP. And just so everybody on the call knows, um, Andrew and I are, we wear a couple of hats. We're also both environmental farm plan advisors. So we're good people to reach out to if you have questions about the intricacies of the environmental farm plan. And Andrew's going to get into the details, but I just wanted to give like the basic introduction that any farm can get an environmental farm plan for free. You can just go through the process. It's confidential and it just, it's an educational exercise so that farms know if they're in compliance or out of compliance with environmental regulations, essentially. And then that whole BMP program that you spoke about is the funding part of the environmental farm plan. And I think it's, it's just really good to know that there's two parts of funding for the environmental farm plan in the BMP program. There's the planning portion that is open all year round. And a lot of farms want plans, whether that be an irrigation management plan, a riparian management plan, um, a pest management plan. Plans are usually less than or $3,000 and they're fully funded through the program and they're available year round for producers to access them. And then the other part of the BMP program is the infrastructure grants. And they're the ones that are a little bit more competitive and they're the ones that sort of the funds are released in the spring usually, and there's just more competition for those. So I just wanted to make that distinction that there's these planning that's funding for plans. that's usually year round, but then there's the infrastructure uh, ones that you know are more competitive and come up in the springtime. So I'll let Andrew take it from here. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, am I sharing the right screen? Does that yep. show the IAF website? Good. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to follow up a little on some of those bigger picture things, you do need an environmental farm plan before you can access the beneficial management practice program, as was asked in the chat. And there are several ways to go about that. Uh, you can learn about the environmental farm plan on this website. And we're going to look at this website a little bit more closely. The program's run by the IAF, so they've got it housed here, along with a pile of other programs that are worth looking into. Uh, so there's a whole lot going on there. Uh, if you want to get an environmental farm plan, you can call Rachel directly. You can call me directly. Uh, Tim Ross in the east, if you know him already. Uh, there's also a, a number of planning advisors in the Okanagan. You just call the, the advisor directly if you know them already and you know they're a, a planning advisor and you just start. It's as easy as that. There's no application process. There's nothing complicated about it. You just get on the phone and start talking. Uh, if you don't know anybody or you don't want to work with the people you do know, you call up the program and they will put you in touch with them and let them, let them know your preference of who you want to work with and what sort of skill set you might be looking for. Similar to what Jeff was saying about the Ministry of Agriculture, planning advisors have very broad backgrounds. So when you get to this site, uh, there's a lot of information. I'll just try and scroll down, not at a breakneck 
pace, but there's information about the EFP and what it is and how it works. It's voluntary, it's confidential, and it's free. You can come on down. This is how you could book an appointment. That's how you would contact them directly. Keep scrolling. You'll see this farm sign. Uh, if when you work through the farm plan process, your workbook comes out with nothing in which you are breaking the law, you can apply for a farm sign. Uh, the reality is that it's difficult to farm and not contravene some regulations. So it's, it's actually not as common to get a sign as you think. And if you don't get a sign, don't feel bad. The whole idea, <clears throat> excuse me, of the beneficial management practice program is to give you some resources to help do things better and to maybe meet some of those regulations or at least mitigate some of those problems and, and do the best you can. So keep going. There it is, the Beneficial Management Practice Program. This tells you what it is. It, Jeff did a, a great job, I think, uh, explaining those details. So go back and, and listen to what he said again. I'm not gonna repeat it. Uh, but what you do wanna do is come down here and click on updated BMP list. I used to condense this into my own spreadsheet but there are so many changes happening all the time, I just couldn't keep the spreadsheet up to date. The best thing is probably just to go here and sift through this fairly long document, which I'm gonna open up right now, just so you get a look at what, what it, it's like. Um, I'm just gonna increase the size here. So is that coming in pretty, pretty well there? Yep. It's gonna be a bit of a scroll here because there's a lot of fine print at at the front of it. Um, your best friend for searching this document is Command F or Control F and use keywords. That's a find function that's gonna work on most computers, uh, most browsers. Um, for example, um, if you go Command F 18, the 18s are all of your irrigation or you could Command F and look up irrigation and it will take you to all 91 references to irrigation and you can scroll through. It's pretty much the fastest way to get through this book. It's gonna be important because that's gonna hit all of the fine print about um, how to do merit-based merit -based applications and all this uh, kind of information that's behind on the irrigation specifically. When you find out what your exact uh, topic is like 1805 that's the practice code for irrigation uh, system replacement or upgrade or 1802 is another one I'm really familiar with is adding uh, automation to your irrigation what you need to do then is scroll through until you hit something that looks like this this is going to tell you what the name of the category is okay it's weather stations improved irrigation management control components all right that's the title over here you've got all the details what's ineligible um, required plans in this case there isn't one if you went down to needing a new main line you would probably need an irrigation plan and you certainly need one for irrigation system upgrades so this is going to tell you all the details on what you need it's also going to tell you the cost share details so back here on automation systems it's a 50% cost share to a cap of $5,000. So what does that mean? If you spend $10,000 on new automatic valves, they'll pay you $5,000 towards it. Um, if you only are paying $2,000 towards something, you'll get $1,000, which is the 50%. So it's 50% to a maximum. Uh, that's kind of how to use, use this sheet. It, it, is, it is quite complex. So this is where your planning advisor comes in. I just want to bring it back to your planning advisor. Your planning advisor is very familiar with this system. Um, to go back to here, the applications are currently closed. Once you have your environmental farm plan, yes, you can go in by yourself, enter your own information and submit your own applications. You can also get your planning advisor to help you out with that. Um, and I have uh, farms that I work with who prefer to do their own applications. They just do their own. And I prefer that, frankly. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in love with filling in applications. But we're here to help. Like, absolutely, give us a call as your planning advisor, and we're going to walk you through that. This can be helpful. I want to talk about one last thing on the cost share. That is, for example, some of you are applying right now to CBT 
funds. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a climate adaptation program on. There are other programs. You can combine funds from multiple programs with a big if. If the funding's coming from the province or the feds, the answer is no. You cannot get a BMP fund and another provincial or federal fund because that's going to be probably all coming through the same uh, CAP program. And we'll see how this changes in the next five years, but I bet it's the same. Uh, if you are doing something through the CBT or a private funder, donations, uh, you know, a, a GoFundMe campaign, like you name it. If you are making your additional funds through any other means other than the province or the feds, you can certainly combine it with this. Uh, one final thing, it, just going back to what Jeff said originally, planning in advance, please plan in advance. We get lots of people last minute, oh, I hear it's opening up, how can I get the funding? Most of these funding categories, especially the bigger ones, require first your environmental farm plan and then some kind of other supplemental plan as well. And Rachel said that those plans are open year round. That's often the case, but it, there are certain exceptions. Currently, plans are not open. We don't know how the budget happens. That's all office management stuff. They shut down plans last December, actually. So there are no plans again. <clears throat> until probably March, maybe even April. We don't know. We never know until the last minute either. Uh, and environmental farm plans are probably gonna shut down in the next uh, month or so and won't open again, again, until contracts are renewed. And sometimes that's not until April. So you really wanna plan the year ahead and get in there while the, you know, make hay while the sun shines. When the money's available, do it. So that's all for me. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. and. Is a general statement, those, the larger funding categories, they usually open in April. And so starting to think about your applications in March is very prudent. And like Andrew said, generally the year ahead, often we work with producers where they're gung-ho for that first year and it, we end up, it, it gets detracted to the, the following year once you get all your quotes and organization in order. So thank you, and I'll hand it over to Jeff again. Thanks very much for the, the tips. Um, and I saw a question in the chat kind of from Tanya connected a bit to the EFP program and how it, is it sort of a, a requirement for, for other Ministry of Ag programs? Um, and that's not a, a always the case situation, but sometimes um, it, it does depend on the program, but, um, you know, a lot of our business programs or other things, it, there's there's no requirement to have your EFP first. Um, occasionally, if it's a, in a program that connects with environment, there may be a requirement, but um, definitely not a uniform rule. So um, I would just kind of investigate a bit specifically with that program is probably the, the advice there. Um, all right. Uh, some of the other things that are kind of ongoing at the moment, I think Phil mentioned uh, when he was describing these programs, the insurance and income protection, so crop insurance and stuff that the province um, offers, those those things are ongoing, so it's not something that has an open application window. Um, the BC Farm Worker Self-Isolation Program, it, it which is something that provides support for producers, if you've had some of your farm workers that have had to quarantine in order to keep everyone safe um, from COVID, um, the costs of some of that can be borne by um, by this program, and and I believe the application sort of time frame that you could claim was extended here until the end of March. So another program that's kind of going to the bitter end of our, our financial fiscal year, and then um, the premises ID and, and livestock tag reader rebate, another one that's going quite late in season. So if if you do have livestock and you use tag readers or our system for 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 logging that, some of the sort of software licensing and stuff can be um, cost shared with that program. So another one that's kind of open on an ongoing basis. But um, so these are kind of Ministry of Agriculture, the BC provincial programs that have those sort of ongoing roles. Um, but I did want to just sort of highlight, there's a couple other things that um, that farms have access to. And um, um, these programs don't have a ton of sort of in-person support within our region, but are, are really good ones to watch. And so they're not run by the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, these are um, federally funded 
um, really focusing on tackling climate change. And so there's a couple ones I would really recommend farmers watch at the moment. Um, these all come from this sort of this big national on-farm climate action fund. And the idea here is to have farmers implement beneficial practices that, that really hit at certain things. And so um, grazing is a big one under there or sort of intensive rotational grazing. Um, the way nitrogen is managed on farm and cover cropping. And so it's, it, this, it's, this is a new thing this uh, past year and it's really introduced sort of a whole new player on the program scene. And, and um, there's a lot of folks offering programs now. And, and unfortunately for farmers, that means navigating the, the mess. And, and, and that is something that, that as regional agrologists, we can help you with because um, ideally, um, you know, we try and keep as up to date with all of this as we can um, and hopefully can save you a bit of time if you need to navigate through this. And, and, and so always an option to just give us a call and say, what the heck, I want to do this. Is there something that, that I can work with instead of trying to navigate all this? So um, did just want to highlight the, the Canadian and Forest and Grasslands Council, they offer this program specifically focused on grazing. And they offer it in a slightly different way from the provincial um, delivery group. And so the Forest and Grasslands Council, they've got an ongoing intake. And so what that means is you don't need to um, time to a specific time frame. You can um, interact with that program now, next month, the month after. Um, it, it isn't a specific application window. Um, it is only for those rotational grazing projects. And um, it does involve having a grazing management plan before you sort of interact with the sort of funding portion of the program. And, and they'll, they'll, that program, you can in it, work with them in the Forage Council to, to figure out who a mentor could be to establish a grazing plan. But it does have that sort of unique spin on the delivery there. But a way to get funding for something like cross-fencing if you want to implement rotational grazing. Um, the... The Investment Agriculture Foundation, they're, they're running this BC Climate Agri Solutions, which is all coming from the same pot as that other one. Um, and they, however, they focus on grazing as well as cover crops and nitrogen management. So the kind of change or the variation here is that they have very specific application windows and they do have one that's open right now. So if you're interested in implementing cover cropping where you haven't before, this program will actually pay for some of your general inputs, which is actually really rare for a lot of um, funding programs. Usually general costs like that, it's just like your cost of doing business of buying seed isn't something that something like the EFP typically funds, but um, this program will. Um, and for the current application window, just a, a heads up, it, it does require that most of your expenses occur upfront. So you do need to spend your money within the next four months if you're applying within this um, January to February window. Um, however, you can carry on with the activities. So just because you bought the seed now, and if that was what you really wanted to do with your project where you needed the funding, um, you don't, it's not saying you have to plant that seed and within that window, um, use the seed when it's needed. As long as that project is implemented within a calendar year of the, of the program, then you can run with it. So some variations of these programs, and, and again, um, we can point you in the different directions and, and there's program staff behind these to help as well. So feel free to reach out if you're, curious or the amount of times that you've seen climate action and <laughs> on farm is um, starting to make your head spin, feel free to ask us for clarification. All right, I think we're towards uh, our end here and then we can hopefully see if folks yeah. have any questions. Yeah, get close. Thanks, Jeff. So AgriService BC, it's a, this is a great place, a great tool. Uh, they've got a website. And this is where, say you didn't know who Jeff or I was, or you couldn't find our contact information, you maybe had a question, this is AgriService BC is the great go-to area on the Ministry of Agriculture, a sort of a place that provides all the information on like funding, tools, services for your business. So uh, as an example, this morning I had a couple emails from AgriService of people who reached out to them first. One was someone looking for information of farmer in Penticton about the KTT program and sort of how they could apply for that. And then someone looking for some resources as in um, the booklets, uh, the countryside and you and the good neighbor, which I've got here is just, oh no, that's not gonna work. Anyways, <laughs> these little booklets, uh, it was someone from the North Okanagan who, uh, wanted a bunch of copies of these to be able to hand out. So 
if you don't know where to go, AgriService is a great place to start. And they have a team that gets in contact with a regional agrologist or the person who is able to help answer your question. And on this slide here, we've got uh, a couple different parts. So AgriService BC webinars. And this is something that uh, there's a, a, a monthly webinar and you could register for them. They're free and they happen on uh, Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific time. And with those, it's, you know, could be a different theme every month, but there is, and you can pick and choose which ones you might want to go to or watch a recording. However, there's webinars that are just handy or could be interesting information for the agriculture community. And then something I am subscribed to, and I think a lot of people should be if they want to keep up to date with what's going on. The Ministry of Agriculture is the AgriService e-bulletin, which again is like sort of a monthly newslettery type thing it's not spammy it doesn't take a long time to read it's just really sort of the coles notes or a good summary of what funding sources may be opened up or what programs are going on and that comes out uh, as a monthly e-bulletin that you can sign up for and honestly it's it's a way that it's a it's a resource that i use as well to to know what's going on to make sure that uh, i'm getting the word out of what is happening and then at the bottom there, I'm, I'm probably jumping the gun on this a little bit as it's currently going through what another agency in the government, which is our communications and public engagement. But uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Agri Service BC, we're looking at starting up the social media. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now there may or may not be already a couple of these accounts operating before approval. I won't say yes or no, but very soon and i'm excited to see this happen as it's a good way for government to stay on top so if you do use social media and you're on that uh, once these do get up and running officially we'll send out sort of it'll probably be on the agri service e-bulletin for sure and then also we'll be sharing this with kbfa and their email list to to help let you know that that's what we got going on but again agri service bc and the socials will be hopefully up in March, which is super exciting. So that's something we haven't had before is that social media content and just a bunch of different and making it easier for people to access the way that they prefer um, and getting that information out there. And here is our contact information. So this is the end of the presentation. As you can see, we've got three different contacts there, Jeff, myself and the agri service contact information so phone number email and their government site so again the agri service website is a fantastic place to start on the ministry of agriculture if you have any questions or ideas and don't know where to go that is the place to start and with that jeff i don't know if you have any closing comments no, I don't think so. Nothing to, to close us off. But um, yes, I, I haven't looked at the chat lately, but I don't know if anyone had any, if we tweaked anyone's kind of interest or questions that came up about any specific programs or. Great. Well, that was really thorough, Jeff. If anybody does have a question, they can feel free to unmute and unvideo and chit chat away. Um, you did cover a lot of ground, so people might be saturated. Yes. or more confused than ever, we'll see. But they, I think most importantly, they know who you and Phil are now, and they know that they can just pick up the phone and have somebody help navigate all of this. So feel free to chime in if everybody, anybody wants to ask a question. Yeah, that's a good point, Rich. That's a good takeaway is Jeff and I are here, regional agrologists for this area. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's a good overview. And yeah, and I think along with that too, like. The Kootenai Boundary Farm Advisors, that's essentially how we function as well. We are just like more octopus arms out there to try to capture questions from folks who are trying to navigate what resources are available to them. But um, I really appreciate your time today putting this presentation together. I am also excited to see what the next five years is going to bring for the Ministry of Agriculture and all the partner programs. Yeah. Um, we'll all wait in anticipation. But I, I know that it's going to have a climate focus. Yeah, and it's going to get really busy as soon as that next five-year deal is reached when they get through negotiations here. I think there's going to be quite a flurry 
of uh, funding and programs and like a lot of things are probably going to open up and and new ones be created as well so all right it'll be like uh christmas for farms hopefully <laughs> we'll see <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for joining today, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's participation. And this is being recorded, so we'll have it up on our YouTube channel in no time at all. And it'll also go out with our February 1st newsletter. All right. Thanks so much for having us. Great. Thank you.